Good evening, I'm Nathan W. Bingham and welcome to Ask Ligonier. The Ask Ligonier chat service is answering hundreds of questions every single day from people all around the world. And tonight, we have a special guest joining the Ask Ligonier team. He's going to answer your biblical and theological questions. And he's going to answer them live here in the studio. Our guest tonight is the senior minister at the First Presbyterian Church of Columbia, South Carolina. He's also a Ligonier Ministries teaching fellow. So Derek Thomas, welcome once again to the Ask Ligonier team. Thank you, Nathan. It's always wonderful to hear your mellifluous Australian come Floridian accent. Well, I appreciate the compliment. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Thomas tonight, be sure to leave it in the comments on the live stream, wherever it is you're watching this evening. You can send us a message direct to Ligonier's Facebook page, our Instagram account, or use the hashtag Ask Ligonier on Twitter. Well, Dr. Thomas, you've been on the Ligonier campus this week here in Central Florida because you've been recording a teaching series on the life and ministry of the Apostle Peter. Now, Peter has a reputation for sometimes putting his foot in his mouth, hopefully something neither of us do this evening. Uh, but what can we learn from the life of, for, of Peter and how, can, or how does he uniquely encourage Christians today? Yeah, Peter is a very different personality from, uh, say, the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul is type A. Uh, he has opinions about everything, and he's always right. And I think Paul was probably difficult to work with, especially if you were of an opposite temperament. And John Mark uh, learned that on the first missionary journey. Paul didn't want to have anything more to do with him if it hadn't been for Barnabas. Uh, and later they were definitely reconciled. But Peter is a person who uh, appears in Scripture warts and all. Uh, there's no attempt to sort of camouflage um, the terrible things that he did. And, and uh, he, he, he spoke before he even thought about what he was saying. Uh, I like the fact that Peter is such a... Uh, an important apostle. He is the number one apostle until Paul comes on the scene. Uh, it's to Peter uh, that Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. And in the first 12 chapters of Acts, um, it's Peter. It's Peter on the day of Pentecost. It's Peter and John preaching in the days and weeks subsequent to Pentecost. And, you know, most of us are flawed characters. We all have flaws in our character. We, we've done things and we wish we hadn't and we're embarrassed about them. And the fact that Peter, despite his flaws and despite his weaknesses, despite his, I think, tendency to pride, not, not surprisingly, given what Jesus said to him in Caesarea of Philippi, that, that he would build a church on Peter's preaching. Um, it's interesting that in his epistles, he dwells on more than one occasion about needing to be humble, uh, needing to be servant-like, submit yourselves uh, to God. And I think it's Peter reflecting on a lesson that it took a lifetime for him, I think, to learn this um, lesson. Before we go to a lightning round, one more question about Peter. Uh, Jesus said he prayed for Peter. What do we learn from that encounter? I have a memory of an elder, uh, this is 40 years ago, uh, who at a prayer meeting on a Thursday evening, you know, Wednesday is the prayer meeting in America, in Britain it, it tended to be Thursday, and um, he prayed long prayers. He was not an educated man, but he had read a lot, um, and he used the language often of the um, Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer. And it was full of these and those and, and so on. And, and it, it was very structured and very ordered and, and very thought out. But these prayers would last for 15 minutes. And he always prayed for me. I was the minister. And I always felt helped and blessed and, and reassured and comforted by the fact that this godly man, and he was... He was more than twice my age, uh, would pray for me. But then Jesus prays for us. He, he ever lives to intercede for us. That uh, every day 
He's bringing us. He's bringing our needs, our trials, our difficulties. He sees us in all of our frailty. And the power of those prayers of Jesus, um, the power and the relationship that Jesus has with his heavenly Father. Uh, how could his heavenly Father say no to a prayer of the Lord Jesus? So uh, this is a a very comforting thing to me. Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He's talking to Peter. But I have prayed for you that your faith uh, will not fail. And uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to wake up in the morning and know that Jesus has already prayed for us this day. And as we face the trials of the day, um, yes, we solicit the prayers of our brothers and sisters uh, and close friends for sure. Um, but there's something even more wonderful about the fact that Jesus, in his office as a great high priest, um, continues to pray for us with, with great fervency and, and passion. We've had a lot of questions come in and a lot of questions still coming in. Uh, if you want to ask a question for Dr. Thomas tonight, be sure to leave it in the comments of the live stream. Send us a message on Facebook. Use the hashtag AskLiganeer on Twitter. All right, we're going to try and get to as many of these questions as we can tonight. So as we typically do, we're going to begin with a lightning round, which means we're looking for answers in the range of 30 to 45 seconds. I know that's not always possible, uh, but we'll try and have short answers. We'll have some time later in the evening for more extended answers. But the first question in the first lightning round comes from Ryan. Uh, he's written to us on Facebook, and Ryan wants to know, what role do deacons serve in the life of the church? Well, you see the proto-deacon in Acts chapter 6 when there's a dispute between Hellenistic wives and, and Jewish widows uh, about poverty relief. And in order to allow uh, the apostles to do what they were supposed to be doing, namely preaching, um, there's an election of what I would think of as proto-deacon. Seven men are chosen. Um, elders in a church rule. Uh, they deal with issues of doctrine. They deal with issues of shepherding. But every church has all kinds of practical things, including distribution of food. Um, in COVID season, we distributed a lot of food to people who are shut in. And uh, that's, that's best done by deacons. And a church with good, godly deacons can work um, just far more efficiently. All right, next question. This is coming to us from Twitter. How can Christians best prepare on Saturday for corporate worship on Sunday? Well, that's a good question. You know, in the past, that was most definitely what was done. And uh, in the 19th, 18th, and certainly in the 17th century, Puritans, for example, uh, would have uh, had a, a ritual of preparing for the Lord's Day. I, th I think in our early marriage, we try to do some of that. Um, if there was a big meal for Sunday, we would do some of the preparations, peeling the potatoes or whatever. And, and you can look at that as, oh, that's legalistic, and that, um, that's fair enough. But it allowed us to have a very relaxed Sunday. Life is busy. Sometimes Monday to Friday is busy. Saturday for a lot of people is busy because of sports and children and, 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 and so on. And to have a day um, of rest, a day free from the tyranny um, of work. So, so preparing on a Saturday, making sure that you're in a state to go to church uh, on Sunday morning and, and, and to be there physically. I think that's important. This question coming in on Facebook, in what ways does the devil attack Christians? Oh, in all kinds of ways. Um, in multiple ways. S some become, you know, it's not necessarily the devil, it may be his interns. You know, maybe we're not important enough to get the attention of Satan. Satan isn't everywhere present. He, he's, he's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. Um, but he has a lot of interns, I think, to do his work for him. And I think he, he, employs, he employs things that we are weak at. He knows our weak points. He knows where we sin easily. He knows if we're tempted to pride. He knows if we're tempted to anger. He knows if we're tempted to be slothful. And he uses um, those. I think there are seasons. Paul talks about um, the evil day in Ephesians 6. And I think he's talking about a season when 
it seems as though the devil is attacking us in every conceivable way. Um, his best strategy is to convince you that religion is only important up to a point and that you don't need to be um, zealous. You don't need to be out and out for it. You don't need to put yourself um, out there. If, if, you're just, if it's just something uh, that you can do and then, and then relax about it, I think Satan is happy. Drew on Facebook is asking this, how do I begin to study the Bible? Uh, open it and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 1, and start reading. And I'm not being facetious. I do think that, that if you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, you need to familiarize with it. Uh, and, and yes, there are arguments. Perhaps you start in the Gospels and then you go to the Epistles, but then you need to, you need to do some work about the Old Testament. But there are lots and lots of a, a Bible study um, uh, a, a, a Bible, what's the word? Study Bible? A study Bible. Um, like a Reformation study like Bible? Like a Reformation Ligonier study Bible. Uh, I think those are excellent. So that as you're reading and, and you're asking questions, there are just helpful little footnotes. Not, not too long, not too distracting, but helpful footnotes to, to um, uh, help you understand the flow of the, of, of the Bible. But you also need to go to a Bible study. You need to go to church. You need to listen to sermons. You need to start reading books about the Bible. And it's a fascinating and wonderful journey, I think, when you reach a point where you think, all right, I think I now understand the overall trajectory of the Bible. And that doesn't come quickly. It, it took me many years. It, it took me through seminary to see um, the unity of the biblical message. This question coming to us on Facebook, how do I know if I'm called to preach? Well, that's also a good question. And, and for some, uh, there is a sense of, of an external overwhelming urge that comes um, sometimes it's a, a, an, an inner conviction. I, I, I love talking to people about the Bible. I've, I've led a Bible study and I enjoyed that. And I, I was given an opportunity to speak to 10 people and I really enjoyed that. And they said, that it, you know, it was helpful. Um, I also think, though, that you need some sense of supernatural calling. Um, that... Uh, that God is calling you, that the Holy Spirit is calling you. And, you know, providence will help you answer whether that is so. Um, and so inching your way forward, talk to two or three of your best friends and say, do you think I could ever be a preacher? Um, and um, I, I'm always encouraging young men, especially to, you know, lead a Bible study, take a Sunday school class um, and see, see what happens. And little by little, um, by confirmation from within, but also confirmation from uh, without, uh, you'll, you'll get to know the answer to that question. Sam, writing to us via Twitter, what happens to God's people after we die? Well, the moment we die, our soul and body separate. By soul, I mean whatever you think of when you say that you're alive, what, what does that mean? What does it mean that you're self-aware? What does it mean to say you have self-consciousness? That's what, that's what the soul is. And that continues after death. So your body dies, but your spirit, your soul, continues. And you, you, you wake up, as it were, uh, in heaven, uh, where Jesus' body is right now. You know, it's, it's like a rent in space, and, and you pass through it and you're where uh, the church triumphant are. Um, it's hard to imagine, uh, I mean, traditional Orthodox Reformed theology suggests that that, that, that is a bodiless existence, that the intermediate state, and, and until uh, Jesus comes again uh, and, and our bodies are resurrected and reunited with our souls, it's a bodiless existence. I'm not sure how to think of that. Uh, I'm not sure how you how you are self-aware if you don't actually have a brain, a physical brain, if you don't have a nervous system. I, I'm, I don't have words to put that together. And there are those who suggest, and, and, and there have been reformed theologians who suggested that there may be some kind of temporary body in the intermediate uh, state. 
uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about it, uh, and he talks about his departure, and then he says, but we have, we have a, a tent, we have a, and he's talking about some, some kind of physical entity um, in which we live out our glorious lives uh, in heaven until, uh, until we are reunited with our resurrected body. This question left to us on YouTube, how do I deal with my self-righteousness and instead trust in Christ alone? Well, um, trusting in one's self-righteousness is a, a constant temptation um, because the gospel is really humbling. It's saying that we are justified, we are reckoned righteous in God's sight without any contribution of our own. And so we need to cast our, well, there's a hymn, it's an old hymn, cast your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet, stand in him, in him alone, gloriously complete. And I think that one of the things that we need to do is to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Every morning we should remind ourselves, what is the nature of my standing in relationship with God? And how is that so? And to remind ourselves of justification by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. But self-righteousness is a constant struggle um, because it is against our instincts to make ourselves nothing in the sight of God. We want, we want some of um, the praise for our salvation. Last question for the lightning round. Uh, this one coming to us from Twitter, a gentleman called Orlando. He wants to know, what are some ways I can discern the state of my heart and my spiritual well-being? Um, <clears throat> prayer. How often do you pray? How fervently do you pray? Uh, how often do you read the Bible? Do you, do you read it with some degree uh, of regularity? And are you thrilled and captivated by what you read? What is your relationship uh, to others? Are you, always, uh, are you always wanting to be number one? Are you always trying to outwit somebody? Um, are you always on the defensive? Uh, as, as, though, as though that would be an indication, perhaps, of some degree of uh, pride. Where are the fruits of the Spirit that Paul speaks of in um, Galatians 5? Are you growing in grace? Do you love Jesus more today than you did last year? Those are some of the ways that we would answer that question. I'm going to add a little bonus question in there to the lightning round. So if someone's listening to that and they're just like, I'm not praying as zealously as I should. I'm not reading my Bible. I don't know if I'm seeing the fruit of the Spirit. What do you say to them? Flee to Jesus and ask Him to give you a heart that loves Him more. Um, you know, we're not, we're not saved by these things. These things don't contribute to our salvation, but they are evidences that we are saved. And, and I think that whenever we're convicted about our sin, we need to take that to Jesus. And Ask him to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Ask us, ask him to give to, to make us genuine. Well, I know many of you are watching tonight because you have biblical and theological questions that you want to hear Dr. Thomas answer for you. And I just want to take a moment to remind you that you don't have to wait for a special evening like tonight. You can visit ask.ligonier.org and the Ask Ligonier chat service, a team of well-trained agents are standing by 24 hours a day Monday through Saturday to answer those questions. I know I've personally found it helpful sitting down for dinner, a meal, and one of my children asked me a question, and I'm just not quite sure if I know the right answer. And so I can open the Ligonier app, tap that chat bubble, and ask one of the Ask Ligonier chat agents and get that answer. Uh, hundreds of other people every day also finding it helpful. So I trust you will too. That's ask.ligonier.org or Press the chat bubble in the free Ligonier app or on Ligonier's website. All right, Dr. Thomas, you've passed the lightning round. We can take as much time as we need. We can't take the rest of the evening to answer this question, but you can have a little bit more time to, to go through these questions and answers. This one is actually coming from the Ask Ligonier chat service. If someone has chatted to us this question, what are the ordinary means of grace and why do we call them means of grace? 
Yes, I'm not altogether happy. I think I'm with Sinclair Ferguson that I'm not altogether happy with with the phrase "means of grace." It 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 is too it is too likely to become something mechanical or something even worse legalistic, maybe. But generally speaking, what we mean by the means of grace is things like um, worship, the Sabbath, the, the reading of Scripture, the preaching of Scripture, the um, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and that those are the ordinary means of grace by which we grow, by which we are fed, by which we are nourished. People are always wanting to uh, do something different. You know, we've done this now for so many years. Let's do something different. Let's liven things up. Let's, let's think outside the box as to what we can do to help us grow. And those questions are not necessarily wrong. Um, but there are, uh, there are things that God has laid down. There's a pattern that God has laid down. There, there is, a, um, there is a, a, a way in which God has given us uh, the, the A, B, and C, and D, and E, and, and F of how we grow as Christians, how we advance as a Christian community. And, and they are going to church and um, singing hymns and psalms and reading the scripture and listening to sermons and engaging in prayer and uh, receiving the sacraments. And these are the ordinary means of grace. And is there an element too where these, these things are very ordinary? It's, it's bread and wine, it's water, it's reading. It's not necessarily the flashy thing right. that some people are seeking after. It's something that any community can do. I mean, if they, if they have a copy of the scriptures, uh, it's something that you can do. You, you can do it if you, churches that gather in a, in a home, for example, in parts of the world, in, 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 uh, in house churches. Uh, everyone has access then to a Bible. They have access to um, preaching. They have access to prayer. They have access to um, bread and wine and, and water. So, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be something that every, every Christian in the world, un unless they're in extreme circumstances, can do. Okay, this question from Karen. Karen would like to know, in light of current events, are we living in the last days? Yes, I thought that question might come up, um, because as we speak, uh, there's a war in uh, the Ukraine uh, by the Russians, and it, it's it's terrible. And I imagine that some Christians, you know, are probably tweeting things and 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 seeing this as an indication uh, that the end is nigh. Well, the New Testament talks about. On the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter talks about something that Joel has written. He's trying to explain the phenomenon of tongues. And uh, he, he quotes from the second chapter of Joel. And he says, in these last times. So in a sense, the last times have been around since Pentecost. We've always been in the last times. We just don't know how long they are. Well, then you have to ask another question. Are there... Are there specific events that are going to happen just prior to the second coming? And there are Christians who believe that. Uh, there are Christians who believe, for example, in the appearance of the Antichrist, uh, the, the beast that is 666 in, in Revelation. Um, they believe, for example, uh, that there will be tremendous war and mayhem all over the world just before Jesus comes. And I don't think that you can be that specific. I think there are always wars and rumors of wars. Uh, what we're seeing this week is terrible, but the world has seen this and, and worse hundreds and maybe thousands of times since, since Pentecost. These events this week are indicative of the fact that Jesus is coming. They are indicative of the fact that this world is a mess. This world is in chaos. This world is under a curse. And it needs to be restored. And one day it will be restored. And one day there will be a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no wars or rumors of wars. 
I, I can't read these events or any events. I can't read COVID-19 and say, yes, Jesus is coming soon. Well, the Bible says he's coming soon, but he, it doesn't tell us how soon that is. And so far it's been 2,000 years, and maybe there'll be another 2,000 years. If, if you think that there are some things in Scripture that have not yet been fulfilled. For example, there are those in our community who believe that Jesus can't come until the gospel has been preached in all the world. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24 and 25, that before he comes, the gospel will be preached in all the world. What does that mean? Does it mean that the gospel must be preached in every people group? I don't have the number in my head, but there are, let's say there are 5,000 people groups. Let's say there are 8,000 people groups. There are different numbers. People do it in different ways. But of those people groups, maybe a third of them still have never heard of the gospel. They are discernible people groups with a discernible language and a dis discernible uh, way of life and, and, and things about their community that, that, are, that are distinguishable, but they haven't heard the gospel. Now, if you believe that, um, Jesus isn't coming tomorrow. You know, he's not coming next week. That's going to take a time. I think those... I think, I think that could be fulfilled if we give our mind to it. I think that could be fulfilled within a generation. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. If, if that is true, that Jesus cannot come back until all the people groups, all the nations of the world have heard the gospel. And, I, and that's where I am right now. I, I think that is, that is a fair um, assessment. So I don't expect Jesus to come tomorrow. I may be wrong. And hallelujah if I am wrong, because good times are coming if Jesus is coming tomorrow for those who know him and love him and are saved. This question from Mark on Facebook. Mark is wanting to know, since God sovereignly ordains evil, how should we react to the evil that we see in the world? Yes, well, this is a twist, I guess, on, on the infamous issue of the problem of evil. And, and if God is good and sovereign, why is there evil? Could he not have created a world in which there was no evil? And the answer to that is probably yes. But I like Augustine's answer to that. Augustine thought about the problem of evil. It troubled him. And he came up with uh, an answer. It's, it's something of an answer. The so-called doctrine of Felix Culpa, the happy fault. And what he was saying in, in effect was that this world that is evil, and it's not just, it's not just the fact of evil, it's the amount of evil. It's, it's not God creating a world in which there is evil. It's, it's creating a world in which there is terrible evil. I mean, horrible, horrible evil. But that world is a better world than a world without evil because that world can know forgiveness. That world can experience grace. If there had been no evil in the world, if God had not, and, and let's for now say, use the word permitted, it's not sufficient of a word, but if God had not permitted evil, there would never have been an incarnation of Jesus. There would never have been forgiveness. There would never have been the experience of grace. And I think, I think you have to answer the question by saying that that world is a better world than a world where there is no grace. God created a world in which it was possible to sin. He created a world where Adam and Eve had free will in a way that we do not. They could sin or they could not sin. And that world was a better world than a world in which God created robots. 
where they had no free will. That he could guarantee that there would never be sin because he, create, he would create a human pair that couldn't sin and wouldn't sin. And again, again, the world in which Adam and Eve fall, and there are consequences for both humanity and the ground. The ground is cursed because of it. That world is a better world than a world in which there had never been any evil at all, because it can experience grace. Now, that was Augustine's um, answer, the happy fault. And there, there are many of us, I think, who still feel that that is probably the best answer uh, that you can give to, to the existence of evil in the world. This question now from JD. JD says, I am reformed, but my wife is not. In fact, she's against Calvinism. How do I approach this? Oh, that's tricky. Um, and it's in the same ballpark, you know, as a Protestant who's married to a Roman Catholic, perhaps. Um, somebody who is converted, perhaps after marriage, but the other partner is not. Um, you know, they're all, they're all difficulties. And I think... I think you have to be tender. I think you have to be patient. I, I think that your marriage is fundamentally important here. You must do everything you possibly can to save your marriage. Um, it'd be difficult to ground, say, a, a, a divorce in its worst outcome um, because she didn't believe in the five points of Calvinism. I, 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 think, I think you have to be patient. You, you, you have to demonstrate somehow to your wife that Calvinism really does make you a better person. Calvinism makes you a better husband. Calvinism makes you a better man, a, a better father. Because Calvinism is about um, obeying um, the, the laws of the New Testament about about sanctification and holiness. That's part of Calvinism, to, to persevere uh, in the faith, to, to be able to see your humility in, in saying, you know, there was nothing that I could do to choose myself. Only God could choose me. That the ultimate ground for the gospel lies in a doctrine of a sovereign, omnipotent God but that that makes you a better person, that that makes you a better husband, a better father. And pray for your wife. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Yes, of course. If we believe God is sovereign yes. and he was able to awaken you, yeah. he can change an Arminian yeah. wife and make her. And don't governor. be belligerent about it. You know, there are seasons when you just have to be quiet um, and, and win them over by love r rather than try to win them over by, you know, beating R.C.'s book on, on, on election over their head. I wish I had been quieter sooner in my journey in Reformed theology. Uh, well, this question from Theodore, he's asking this on YouTube. Why is understanding the gospel so crucial? Because life and death are involved. Because eternal life or eternal death in hell are in the balance here. It's vitally important to understand the gospel, that we are saved through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from the works of the law. You get that wrong, everything goes wrong. If you get that wrong, you're not saved. If you get that wrong, you will spend eternity in hell. If you want to be sure, if you want to be certain that you will spend eternity in the presence of Jesus forever, forever and ever, you you have to understand the rudiments of the gospel. Now, there are those with an understanding of the gospel and there are those with a better understanding of the gospel because all of your life you will be thinking about the gospel. I think I have a better understanding of the gospel now than I did 50 years ago when I was saved. And so I continue to, to grow in my understanding of what the gospel means and how it works in my life on a daily basis. Ligonier has recently published a book that you wrote, Let Us Worship God, 
and you unpack some of the, the hows and whys of Christian worship. Could you speak a little bit to the benediction? What is the benediction and why does it appear in many Christian worship services? Well, it appears because it's in the New Testament. And it appears that in the New Testament, in the early church, uh, there was a use of a benediction. The early church got it from the Old Testament. We think of the Aaronic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So part of the liturgy of the synagogue, part of the liturgy of the temple included benedictions. Benediction comes at the end of the service. And a benediction is a blessing. It, it, it's a gospel blessing. It's saying to the people of God, now, you've worshipped, you're going out to the rest of the week to work and labor, go in peace. Go with the blessing, the assurance of God's covenant promises upon you, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that you are Christ's and that you will be Christ's forever. You may experience trials and difficulties this week, but you are covenant children underneath the umbrella of the covenant blessings. You're not under the covenant curses. You're under the covenant blessings. So remind yourself that you're under the shadow, uh, better, under the sunlight of the gospel this coming week. It's a, it's a very glorious moment, I think. Um, you know, some preachers lift their hands. Um, I do. Because I think, I think they did in the early church. And, and so it, it's a gesture. It's a, in Britain, um, people close their eyes in the benedictions because I think wrongly they understand the benediction as a prayer, as, as, a, as, a, as a wish. But the benediction is a declaration. And so a lot of ministers I will say, um, lift up your heads and open your eyes and receive the benediction. Because it's not my benediction. It's God's benediction. I was greatly impressed for a season when uh, a dear friend of mine, Dale Ralph Davis, an Old Testament um, professor and author of many books on historical books of the Old Testament. And he was with us in First Columbia uh, for five years as the evening preacher. And he, he would make up his own benedictions. And I'd never done that. I'd always used benedictions that are in the Bible. But I've, I've been freed from that uh, following him. And I've, I've come to the point now where I, I very often will make up my own benediction and uh, use part of the sermon as the benediction or use a very familiar um, line or two from a hymn, a good gospel hymn, uh, and turn that into a benediction as a word from God uh, of blessing for the coming week. Well, if you'd like to study worship with Dr. Derek Thomas, I encourage you to visit ask.ligonier.org slash offer. Of course, don't do that right now. Wait till uh, this time is over. But as our way of saying thank you, we'd like to give you a free digital download uh, of his book, Let Us Worship God. So that web address again is ask.ligonier.org slash offer. Exclusive for you as our way of saying thanks for watching us live tonight and participating by submitting your questions. Okay, Dr. Thomas, next question here is from Alan on Facebook. They're wanting to know, is it appropriate for Christians to pray the imprecatory Psalms against wicked rulers and tyrants in the world? Yes. Uh, I did last Sunday against uh, President Putin. And um, he's behaving tyrannically. Um, there comes a point when it is right, I think, to use those imprecatory psalms. Um, I, I prayed that God would save his soul, but that he would destroy the tyrant. Um, and the two could be synonymous. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there are occasions when, when there are rulers in the world that are so wicked, they're so evil, um, that this is not a desire for me personally to take him out, I'm, I'm not going to do it. God needs to do it. It needs to be an act of God to, to remove a source of great evil so that relief and blessing will come to his 
um, subjects. Yes, I think it is. It needs to be done very carefully. It needs to be done with some forethought. The occasion needs to be correct. But there are times, I think, when, when you should do just that. Patsy on Facebook is asking, do you have any words of comfort for people who are concerned about wars and other current events? A robust doctrine of providence. I can imagine some folk, and, and this may not have been the intent of this question, but I can imagine some folk, and, and they're sensitive, and they've been watching maybe the news, and maybe too much of it, and they've seen things, and they've read things, and, and it's upset them, and now they're fearful, and they're fearful maybe in a way that Christians ought not to be afraid. I, I think there might have been some of that during the last two years um, in the world, where people weren't even sure what they were afraid of anymore, but they were just afraid. And I think you need a robust doctrine of providence, that God is in control. He orders the end from the beginning. He orders not just good things, but evil things. Um, I was, this week I've been talking about Peter and Pentecost. When Peter preaches that sermon, he, he, he tells his fellow Jews, who, and this is just six weeks after the crucifixion, he's, he's, he tells them, it was you by wicked hands who took him and slew him. They were guilty. Some of the people listening to Peter were there, shouting uh, for Jesus to be crucified. Crucify him, crucify him. But it was all by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Yes, they were responsible for their actions, but none of it happened outside of the decree of God. God knows the end from the beginning. God, God orders our lives. He holds us in the palms of his hands. How many times in the Bible does God come and say to his people, do not be afraid? There's a book in it somewhere. There are, there are dozens and dozens of occasions when God comes to his people when they're in trouble. And he says, do not be afraid. If we have God, if we're in a right relationship with God, we have nothing to fear. That doesn't mean to say that trials don't come. That doesn't mean to say that wars may, may not break out. It doesn't mean to say that we might not be on the brink of World War III. I, I have no idea. I, do, I don't know. But I do know this, that God, uh, God is in control. There are no, there are no blind spots. There are no dead zones. You know, you, you, the, the, there are sections in America where you travel and your phone doesn't work. And you look at it and you haven't got a signal. There's absolutely no signal here. There are parts of South Carolina that I go to. There's absolutely, it's a dead zone. There's no signal. And they, and they say to me, you know, you have to climb that mountain over there. It's not a mountain, it's a hill. But you have to climb that hill over there and then you might get one or two bars. There are no dead zones as far as God's providence is concerned. You know, you can't, you can't drive up I-4 and then at, at Junction 28 through Junctions 32, God isn't in control. It, it, it's, it's Satan's territory. No. He's in complete and utter control. Della on Facebook is asking, how can we guard ourselves against a hardness of heart toward the Lord and come to love him as we ought? That is a good question. Um, there are moments in our lives when we are in danger. When, when we sin and we don't immediately repent. When we nurse that sin. When we nurse a grievance. When things don't go our way. We wanted and thought we were marrying this person, but he turned out to be someone else. We wanted to be rich. We wanted to live in a big house and have wonderful vacations and, and so on. And, and it, it's, a, you know, it's a struggle. Um, I had dreams, but, but cancer came. And you begin to nurse that resentment. And, and you, know, you need to confess that resentment to the Lord. You need to ask him to... Uh, 
to forgive you. You, you need to ask yourself, ask him to, to, to bring you back into a, a, a right relationship where you accept God's providence. That doesn't mean to say that things can't change, and it doesn't mean to say that you don't pray for things to change, but you don't nurse those, those wounds and, and, and grievances. I've seen it too many times. Um, people are angry about something, and when you ask what it is they're angry about, it happened 30 or 40 years ago, and they're still talking about it. They're still nursing it. They've wasted all these years um, unable to, to do certain things because of the burden of this this anger, this frustration, this resentment. Um, humble yourself beneath the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. This question coming to us via Twitter. How can church members help to create greater unity within a congregation? Oh, my. Um, praying for one another, being friendly to one another, uh, realizing that there are first things and there are second things and there are third things. There are first things. If, 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 if people are disagreeing about justification by faith, that's a first thing issue. But if people are quarreling, you know, about minor things, trivial things, things of no consequence, You've, you've got to learn to put others before yourself. Um, we saw a lot of this in COVID season. You know, we all had different opinions about everything, about every aspect of life and science and whatever. And what we did in churches and what we didn't do in churches, and people got all het up about it. And there were times when I did things that I really didn't know why I was doing them, but I did them for the sake of the body. I did them for the sake of unity. I would tell myself in my head, this makes absolutely no sense at all. But they think it makes sense. The majority thinks it makes, makes sense. And I'm not going to divide the church over this. And, and we must uh, learn to be forgiving. Um, learn, learn to be quick to forgive. Uh, slow to speak. Slow to anger, but quick to love and quick to forgive. You'd think, you'd think that would be common sense within a church community, but it often isn't. And it strikes me again and again how often in the epistles, in Paul's epistles, in Peter's epistles, in John's epistles, that they're addressing these very issues of Christian unity. Uh, churches getting along um, with, with each other. Yeah, you, there are things that are, first of all, that, that, okay, we can't have unity unless we're agreed on these primary, first of all, things. But there are things that are secondary and things that are tertiary. Well, I know most of you, if not all of you watching, already subscribe to the Ask Ligonier podcast. But just in case there's someone there that is not a subscriber, know that we do have Ask Ligonier, the podcast. New episodes drop every Thursday. We invite special guests onto the podcast to answer your biblical and theological questions. And know that that content is exclusive to the podcast. Our guests are coming in to answer questions from you, the listeners. So if you do not subscribe to Ask Ligonier, the podcast, be sure to search for Ask Ligonier or Ligonier Ministries in your favorite podcast app and subscribe. A new episode will be there this Thursday. All right, Dr. Thomas, we're going to go into a second lightning round for the evening. So we want to get through as many of these as we can. Shorter answers, if possible. This one from YouTube. Uh, what does it mean to lay up our treasures in heaven? Not to make a worldly treasure the be-all and end-all of your existence. Some people get worldly treasures. That's God's providence. But don't be angry if you don't get them. So live, live for eternity and not just for the present. Live for the future and not just the present. Robert on YouTube is asking, does Scripture say whether or not cremation Crema yeah, cremation is acceptable. Burial versus cremation. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because there are areas of the world I want to be buried for sure. And I, I, I think that most of us think in terms of the resurrection body 
that, that, it, that it fits an idea of, of burial. But there are Christians and they're terrified. And they shouldn't be, but they are, that they'll be buried and they're still alive. And, and uh, you know, and there have been awful examples of it. Um, and then on the other side, there are people, you know, who have been burnt, who, who have drowned in the sea and the fish have eaten them. You know, so there is no body to be buried. And so the resurrection body is not totally dependent on the burial of a physical body. But, uh, and there are parts of the world where there is so little land for burial in huge, vast cities, like, like, um, like in Mexico, for example. And, and there, are, there are just vast, vast cities uh, that there's no land to be buried. So I wouldn't be hard and fast on it. We allow both in our church. Paul on Facebook wants to know, do prophets and apostles exist today? No. It's an easy lightning round question. Do you want to expand? I'll move on. I think that prophets uh, and apostles were uh, temporary. P- prophets uh, and apostles... Uh, were, were before the written scriptures were given. And, and I, think, I think that in 1 Corinthians 13, there is a, a verse. It's, it's, people disagree about it. Uh, but when that which is perfect is come, then that, then that which is imperfect will be done away with. And, and there, there is a sense, I think, that, that now that we have the Bible, we have no need for prophets and apostles. Okay, Beth on Twitter would like to know, what will God's redeemed people be doing in the new heavens and the new earth? That's a great question. And I think we should think about it a lot more. You know, there are, there are certainly those who are going to be out of work. You know, lawyers and doctors are going to be out of work. Um, maybe, maybe there'll be a different kind of, of medicine to do. Maybe there'll be a different kind of legal work to do. But I, I think that the new heavens and new earth, you know, what's it, what's it going to be like? It's going to be like this, without sin. So there are trees and rivers and, and fish and birds and animals and, and, and redeemed uh, human beings who are going to live forever. And we will still, I think, be engaging in um, making the world, exploring the world, understanding the world. So, so engaging in uh, ethical science and engaging in art and and composition and music and all kinds of things. Rebecca on Facebook, what should we do if we cannot find a church that feels right? Well, if you're if you're elderly, for example, infirm, and there isn't a a reformed church, say, within 50 miles of where you are. We have folk who have joined our church. I have no idea what the Apostle Paul would make of this, but they found us in COVID. They found us live streaming. We've become their church. They aren't able to go anywhere else. So there's, there's that. I, I, think, I think that you probably should look for a church where you can be the most happy and the most useful, if that's at all possible. If it's not possible, um, then you need to supplement what it is that you're getting. And we live in a day when that's easy. You've got Ligonier. You've got all kinds of things on uh, the internet. You've got books and downloads and, and podcasts and, and this event and other things that can help you grow uh, and, and help you where the, where the church doesn't help you much. And, and I think that you can use those in certain circumstances. It depends on what the church is. You know, there's a certain line over which I couldn't cross. I would consider moving. Um, Go and find a church where you're going to be really useful and, and move there. And find a job there, if, if that's possible. Maria on YouTube is asking, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12? I don't know. Um, it's possible that it was something to do with his eyesight. 
because of what he writes in Galatians, see with what large letters I have written to you. And people have conjectured that, that, that he couldn't see very well and this, this was his thorn in the flesh. It may have been, it may have been a, a demonic oppression of some kind. I, I, I don't know. This question from the YouTube live stream, how do I avoid both antinomianism and legalism? Jesus, the gospel. People think that the solution to legalism is to loosen up a bit, become a little antinomian. And people think that when you're antinomian, what you need is just a little bit of legalism. It's and a dose of the law. Yeah, just, and, and so they swing from one to the other. And actually, the solution to both is Christ. Run to Jesus, run, run to him. And when you run to Jesus, you'll get an understanding of the gospel better. Stephen on YouTube is asking, how would you help someone who is struggling to understand infant baptism? Oh, I have dear friends in this very position. Um, you know, you can give them books on infant baptism and you can give them your take on infant baptism, but it's probably not going to do a great deal. For me, infant baptism was like, and I, and I was a Reformed Baptist for a period, and for me it was like a gestalt. You know, you, you look at a picture, and what do you see? You, I see a rabbit. And then you shut your eyes and you look at it again. It's a witch on a broomstick. It's the same picture, but you, suddenly you're looking at it from a different perspective. And there's a way of looking at the Bible from a different perspective. And you get infant baptism. And there's a way of looking at the Bible from a different perspective. And what you see is credo baptism. I'm thoroughly convinced about credo baptism. Hannah on Facebook, what books do you tend to have sitting next to your Bible? Oh, well, I'm unusual. I, I, I have a lot of books, and uh, I, I like books that are... I like a hymn book. If I, if I was banished to a desert island, if that's the question, it would be a hymn book. It would be Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. It would be Calvin's Institutes. It would be Augustine's... Confessions, if that's all I'm allowed. But um, I, I'm constantly reading, and, and I, I read in uh, not not sp sporadically. You know, a new book will come out, and I'll read it. But last year, for example, I made last year. I, I wanted to pick up on uh, a Syrian and. Uh, Persian history. I knew a little bit about it. I've written a commentary on, on uh, Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, and so I, I, I knew something about the Persian Empire, but I wanted to know about it in depth, so I, I just decided to read 12 mm. volumes by not necessarily Christians, historians, great historians, on the Persian Empire, and I think I understand it a little better. This year it's the Greek Empire. Okay. But that's odd. I'm not going to say that. You said that. Our last question for the lightning round from Eric on Facebook. Uh, he says, at church I'm being taught that God loves everyone the same way and that God loves the people in hell. Is this what the Bible teaches? No. No. The wrath of God abides on those in hell forever. You know, I, I don't know who this person is, and I don't know what his circumstances are, but this is not, this is not the Bible that he's hearing. This is, this is something else. This is a different religion. This isn't what Jesus taught. So I would advise this person to find a church where the gospel is actually preached. That's the end of the lightning round. And before we get to some final questions, I just want to remind you to visit ask.ligonier.org slash offer, where you can request your free copy of Dr. Thomas's new book, Let Us Worship God. Uh, this ebook download is available for you immediately, just as our way of saying thank you for joining us live this evening. Well, this question from Tim on Twitter, he would like to know, in what ways can the church minister to people suffering from Alzheimer's disease or dementia? Oh, that's a great question. We have given some thought in recent years to seniors' ministry. And 
uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and, and, and other conditions uh, are, are very prevalent. And how to do that in conjunction with um, things that are offered uh, in the world, uh, things that the state uh, offers, things that um, the federal government might offer in terms of medical care and so on. But what, what else can we do? And um, typically, if, if they're in an advanced state, they're going to be in some kind of nursing facility of some kind. And so visiting them as much as possible. Um, you know, those with Alzheimer's and dementia can often remember things from when they were younger. They can often remember, say, the 23rd Psalm. Um, I've, I've certainly been in conditions where somebody with fairly advanced dementia of some nature. But as soon as we began to sing a very familiar hymn, um, they would join in. They had no idea who you were. They don't even know where they were, but they do remember this. And I've seen that so many, many times. Um, so I think, I think even in cases of advanced dementia, I think it's important to go and read very familiar scripture to them. Um, maybe take a, a tape. Well, I'm, I'm, who does tapes anymore? But, but use your iPhone and, 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 and play them very familiar um, hymns. And I think it'll surprise you what is possible. This is the last question for tonight. And it's, it is a question that we are asked often. Um, and I think it's a question that I'm asking our guests often. And I want to say that these are being submitted by other people. It's not because I really need to hear the answer again and again, although it's always a helpful reminder to hear this. But the question is, how can I be sure I'm saved? I can't give you that assurance. You know, I can't say in nomine patriot filius spiritus sanctus, you know, you're saved. I can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that, can give you that assurance. And so you must pray for it. You must have an, a, a proper understanding of the gospel. Have you come to Jesus? Have you believed in him and in him alone for your salvation? Do you believe that anything that you do is going to contribute to your salvation? Do you look to anyone else but Jesus for your salvation? Has anything in your life at all changed that might suggest that you have been born again, that might suggest that you have a new heart? Where, where do you find your greatest sense of joy? Maybe not all the time, but there's something about worshipping Jesus. There's something about reading the scriptures. There's something about being in church surrounded by believers that gives me a sense of fulfillment, that, that I know who I am in a way that the world can, can never do. I, I think you pray for it. Um, but we are told, I mean, our own confession of faith, Westminster Confession of Faith, tells us that God may for a season withdraw that assurance to make you long for it more, to make you cry out to him more, perhaps to humble you for it. A season. Well, Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. And thank you for joining us live and for submitting all of those questions. Remember, when you have a biblical or theological question, you can always ask Ligonier. Well, I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and I look forward to seeing you next time.